week's episode of Cook Honey is brought to you by COVID Me Shampoo. Shampoo for the John Hunter, Zachary Binks, Jonathan Taylor, Thomas, and all of us. This week is dedicated to the queens in our life. That's right, we're talking the Cleopatras of Clean Your Room, the Nefertitis of Never Gonna Happen Under This Roof. We're talking the Empress of I Brought You Into This World and I Can Take You Out. That's right, this week is dedicated to the goddess of Grounded, that queen of your heart, that number one. That's right. Yo, mama. Cause this week we're serving no drama for yo mama. This week's episode is all about eggs. Long, beautiful eggs. De zoof. Um, huevos. Uh, so many different names for them. And there's so many different type, uh, types of eggs. Around the world, humans eat duck eggs, chicken eggs, ostrich eggs, you name it. And actually, most historians believe that as long as humans have existed, we've eaten eggs of some sort. Why? Hunting and gathering. That's right. Even the most sort of historic human had to hunt and survive for food. And one of the easiest ways to get food was egg snatching. Um, nests around different areas and they've been a part of our cuisine and cooking since as long as we can remember. I am so excited to be celebrating Mother's Day with you all and especially celebrating with the glorious egg. That's right, as long as humans have been eating the egg, the egg is also acted as a symbol of feminine and birth and new life. We use it in Easter in the spring. Um, it's often used as a symbol of fraternity, fraternity, fraternity. It's used as a symbol of fertility um, globally, as well as just a nourishing, simple food that feeds the heart and feeds the soul. I want to tell you the truth about your grocery store eggs. Now, it doesn't matter if you buy the expensive hipster brand or the standard grocery store brand. The important thing to know about these eggs is it doesn't mean that this one that's more expensive is fresher than this one. Um, what it does mean is that maybe these farmers put a little more care into their chickens. They can make some guarantees about how their chickens are raised. but. When it comes to fresh, freshness, the only thing you can do is check the label. And I want to talk to you about that today. So there's two dates that you will see on every egg carton. One date is your standard expiration date. It's read in our month, day, year format. And easy to read. But then somewhere around that, you're going to see a three-digit number. And this number is your Julian date. And that is the date that the eggs were stuck in the carton. Now, this package does say that that's when the eggs were laid. However, this package will only indicate when they were stuck in the carton. Your average farmer has 30 days to stick those eggs from the time they're laid into a carton. From then, they're transported to a grocery store, and usually from the time they're in the carton, it's an additional 30 days after that. Now, our eggs in our grocery store have been washed and processed, which means they're not going to have the shelf life that backyard chicken eggs or fresh farm eggs freshly laid are going to have. There's a bio coating on the outside of those eggs that help protect them. So you can, you know, leave fresh farm fresh eggs on the counter um, for days or a week um, and it won't be a problem. You can keep them in the fridge for six months. So what I want you to understand about those grocery store eggs is both of those grocery store eggs were f um, laid in March. It is now May, so they're already two months old and on the end of their spectrum. I wanna show you how you can test your eggs to see how fresh they are. So here is a grocery store egg right from this pack. Now these were laid in March, and if I put this in the water, at the bottom,
you will notice that it is kind of turned up on the edge. So it bobbles. It's not laying flat. There is a bobble. Okay. That means that this egg is getting ready to turn straight up. So this egg is going to be good for a frying, to mix in something. This egg is going to be fantastic uh, in that realm. Um, it's almost, uh, it's still flat enough that I would still eat this fried, but it's getting to the point where I would only mix it into something and bake something. So let's see what one of those eggs look like. So this egg is at its last leg. So notice this one is going to stand almost straight up. Okay, this egg is going to stand almost straight up in this little uh, cup of water. And it's big enough that the egg can lay down flat. But this is going to stand up because there's more air. As the egg dehydrates, that air gap in the inside of the egg um, grows larger, which gives it more floating ability. If an egg ever floats on you or stays in the middle of the cup, that egg is bad. Throw it away. It is not good to eat. This egg is going to be far better for baking and mixing in things and not to eat as fresh. It's just not going to have that fresh egg. Um, the whites are going to be really disconnected from the yolk. This is the kind of egg when you crack it in a pan and it spreads all over the place. That's a sign of an egg that's not as fresh. Still good, just not as fresh. And the last egg I want to show you is significantly smaller, and I'll explain why. But notice it lays perfectly flat. This egg was laid two days ago. It is fresh. So um, this was laid in a backyard. Uh, this is Ross's mom's chicken eggs. And so I know that they're fresh. I know that that is going to be a really fresh egg. All right, kids, the word of the day is E-G-G, -G, egg. All right, kids, let's test eggs. Fill a bowl with water and drop your egg in. If it lays flat, it's nice and fresh, good for poaching and frying. Drop another egg in. If one end bobbles up, this egg's going to be better for frying and hard-boiled egg. That's right, easier to peel. If you drop an egg in and it stands up on one end, unfortunately our friend is getting old and is only good for baking. Last, if your egg's a floater, don't go, because our sad friend is ready for the trash. Doing a traditional poach of your eggs is quite simple. Here are the materials I think are necessary to have a successful poaching session. One, a bowl of ice water and water. This is going to stop the cooking of the egg once you're done poaching it. Also, you're going to be able to then put a wrap over this and put it in the fridge. Tip number one, make your poached eggs in advance and reheat them. It can be finicky. You can screw up, especially if you're new at this. So if you're doing a brunch for someone special and you want to make sure your eggs are good, just do them in advance. That way you have some practice. You can keep the good eggs if you want it to look pretty and that's a really big concern for you. Then go ahead and do that. Um, so my bowl of ice water. You're going to want a slotted spoon. This is good to kind of stir around in the pan but also to scoop your eggs out. A mesh strainer is really important. So I'm going to put that over a little bowl like this. This is going to allow me to crack my egg into it and any of the extra runny white that I need to get rid of will stay in this bowl and then the nice white and yolk I can put in here. This is going to help stop some of those frilly whites that you see and that people freak out about. I personally don't care about the frilly whites. Um, again, that's an aesthetic thing in my opinion. So um, last thing you're going to need is a paper towel to dab um, your spoon on before you kind of pop them in the water. So let's go ahead and get started. Egg. Always crack away from the bowl you want. You don't want to accidentally get chill in there. Always crack on a flat surface. A lot of people like to crack on the edge of things. That's pointless. Crack on a flat surface. Over into a bowl. And then into this one. So now, 
So now what you're going to do is you're going to want to bring your water up to a light boil, a simmer. You should have bubbles at the bottom. They should start to just come up. I like to just get my water going on a very low temperature instead of going high and then drop it down. I find it easier. Just let it come up naturally. Get your eggs ready. In this pot, I could do, I would probably do four to six eggs. I'm only going to do one because, again, I don't want to waste resources. But you could do that many in here. You would just go clockwise so you can time them out uh, correctly. So I have nice little bubbles on the bottom of my pot. They're just starting to come up. I can put my finger in and pull it out without really saying, ouch, I almost want to say ouch. And that's a good indicator you're at the right temperature. I'm going to take my slotted spoon and kind of ruin these bubbles because they can leave an imprint on my egg. And if you're worried about those aesthetics, um, you can do that. So I'm going to go ahead and stir that water, get rid of the bubbles. I'm going to go ahead and put my egg in. I'm going to tilt it. I'm going to let some of the water come in. Let the egg come out and then let it cook. I'm gonna put this in there for three to four minutes. You cook it to the doneness you want. You notice that the egg is just set about a minute or so in. Gently take your spoon and kind of jiggle the egg because it can stick. So it's been four minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and check my egg for doneness. Remember, you can cook it as firm as you want. So I'm going to pull this out. Look at that little, little pocket. And I'm going to give her a squish. This for me is still a little too wet. So I'm going to resubmerge. Release if she'll come off the spoon. And then I'm going to go ahead and wait another maybe 30 seconds. A good note about those little wispies that everybody for some reason gets hung up on. It's just egg. Um, after you cool it in the cool pot, uh, bowl, you can actually just trim the wispies off and no one would ever know. Or if you had like a towel you were willing to use, the paper towel is going to stick to. Um, I suppose I could just lay it right on the table as well. You could just use the edge of this spoon and just curl them off and then you're fine. You have a perfectly poached egg that for some reason meets your beauty standards. All right, this egg is done. There we go. Nice firmness. Dab, dab, dab. Soak up some of that water. And then we're going to release into the ice bath. That's going to stop the cooking. It's going to guarantee that my poached egg is safe. And that's it. That's a simple standard method, method of poached egg. Now, just for fun, let's see what we can do in a traditional method with a not fresh egg. So remember, this egg was kind of standing up. Let's go ahead and crack it into our sieve. Drain it off. There we go, if you kind of wiggle it around, see those runny whites come off, the ones that are really like water. There we go. So once we've drained as much of that as we can, plop the egg gently into this bowl. Okay, and then again, we're going to submerge the edge of the cup into the water. Let some water come in the cup and wash the egg out. Immediately, the egg is kind of spread, okay? What I think is going to happen is we're going to see more separation of that yolk and that white because the white is just not strong enough to encase the um, yolk. Also, the, it's going to be a flatter. I'm assuming it's going to be a flatter um, instead of a nice round uh, poached egg pouch. It's going to be way flatter. I can already see it's flattened out. So we're at that four minute mark with our older egg. It does need more time, but I don't know if you can see this. Let's dab it. 
you can literally see that yolk. It's not as pouched. And we're out. Again, dab, dab, dab. Notice how spread that egg is. It is not the cute little pouch that the other one was. Let's do a little experiment. I'm gonna do an overhead shot with three eggs in the pot. Uh, I'm gonna use a different pot from this one um, so I can film it better. But I wanna see what each of the old, like a very, very old egg, a medium egg, and a young egg looks like overhead while uh, poaching. So just to recap, here are my tips. One, use a wider pot with three inches of water. Two, fresh, 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 fresh eggs. It's not really a tip, everybody says that. Three, strain your runny egg white out. That is like also a little important step that I think will help your success. Four, make sure when you put your egg in that you tilt, let some water in and slowly let your egg um, slowly let your egg kind of fall down into the pot. And five, don't bring your water to a boil. Just let the bubbles accumulate on the bottom. That's going to be hot enough um, to poach your eggs. So, okay, we've done all this. You're like, Joe, it is COVID-19. I can barely get eggs. I don't care if they're fresh. I still want poached eggs. So I'm going to show you the saran wrap trick. So we take some saran wrap. You're gonna put your saran wrap in the bowl or a mug like this. Now, my little tip is to use a tad touch of oil. Uh, if you wanna get extra fancy, you could use like truffle oil or uh, garlic oil, and that'll season the egg a little bit. This is also a great way to get seasonings. You could do herbs inside of your poached egg, um, where normally you can't do that. This is a way to kind of circumvent that. So I'm going to rub that oil all the way around. Now I have a second piece of saran wrap I've created a tie with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an egg, I'm going to crack, drain out the watery Helps to rotate it sometimes. See, you can just see water yolk. And then go ahead and plop that into your saran wrap. Now, these watery yolks make great uh, meringue. Older, uh, sorry, these watery whites make great meringue. So now I'm going to take my little bundle here. I'm going to gather everything up. I'm going to leave just a little bit of air space. Um, so it gives the egg a chance to puff and expand. I'm going to really twist that tight. I'm going to add my little saran uh, tie, and then I'm going to tie a knot. So now I have this little egg pouch. I'm gonna do the same process. And this is a great way, one, you just need to get this done. You wanna make sure that they all turn out right. This is great to do for parties and actually a lot of restaurants to use this trick. Then same temperature water, put that in there. You are gonna need about a minute longer than your normal uh, poach because it's gotta get through that saran wrap. The saran's gotta heat up. So I'm gonna go ahead and set the timer for five minutes. Actually, I'm gonna do four again and check it. I just like to be safe. So four minutes, four and a half minutes, um, and then we'll see where it's at. All right, so that's the time. I'm gonna go ahead and put this on my slotted spoon. Simply cut the knot. And voila, look, a beautiful little nugget of a poached egg.
again, go ahead and slide this into our bowl, our chilling bowl, and you're done. So that's an easy way to do multiple eggs, water same temperature, you just put them in your saran wrap, tie it off, and put them in the bowl. It's safe, it's easy, you can even use your older eggs because it's gonna hold it together for you. Um, and that's just a kind of nice, safe way. You are gonna get some of the lines from the saran wrap, but again, I don't think it matters. And you could flavor your poached egg, which opens up a whole nother um, culinary um, piece of excitement. So that's poached eggs in a nutshell. It's not as hard as it may seem, pun intended, get it hard, brooch. Um, they're not hard, they're soft and gooey and creamy and perfect and great on toast and um, they elevate anything. Put a poached egg on top of a steak and it'll taste like a thousand dollar dinner. So these are poached uh, eggs. They are the crown jewel in any brunch. They are the crown jewel in any meal. And so go ahead and use them, explore with them, celebrate with them, make some for your mom um, and celebrate. All right. It's time for What's the Tea, honey, where we're in search for the absolute capital T truth. And this week, I am so excited to be collaborating with my favorite co-host of my favorite show on Ghostlight TV, The Deadweight Survival Guide. We zoomed in on a meeting, and you get to have a little taste on it. Not only did we talk about, you guessed the yo mama, but we talked about my challenge for the week. That's right. This week, for you did what, honey? I'm going to be doing brunch in a movie. They're giving me a movie to inspire my cuisine. So let's get the truth. Hi guys, I'm excited to spill the tea with these two beautiful co-hosts with me of the Deadweight Survival Guide, available on Ghostlight TV, uh, TV's YouTube channel. It's a fantastic show, you should watch it. There are great moments and they kind of talk about surviving those mundane things of life. Um, so we have with us Christopher Daniels. Hi. And Joe Daniel Montalongo. What it is. And so can you guys just tell us a little bit about your show? Absolutely. So um, Chris and I came up with the concept because we love watching movies and we love giving our opinions about movies as queer people. Mm -hmm. And we decided what if we were the ones who gave you advice on how to live your best life based on all our cinematic knowledge. But given that we are the ones who probably wouldn't survive a pandemic, epidemic, disaster, zombie apocalypse, whatever, we're like, okay, who better than to help out the people at home? Absolutely. And the show is entirely based on providing nonsensical tips and tricks that no one should ever truly follow in order to navigate any apocalypse that you might encounter. Everything from the really fantastical to the everyday Monday. But what I love, though, is there's always the legit like tea truth in there like the things you don't want to admit but like you're just sitting there watching this and you're like damn that's so true that's so <laughs> real life right there and i think that's why i love it is like it's wrapped up in silliness but it's legitimate like there are some just solid capital t truth like yes that's exactly why everybody be hating weddings or that's why everybody is gonna die in a zombie apocalypse anyway because you know or i'm gonna die first in that film because you know I can't do nothing. So I listen. Just, I the love best it. way to incorporate vegetables into children's dietary things is to mix it up with delicious food. And the best way to give people the truth is to mix it in with some silliness, because then they're like, mm. Mm -hmm. "Oh, actually, yeah, that's a good point." And that's the way we do it here. I love that. I love that. All right. So, kind of moving along here, the theme this week is sort of Mother's Day -y for my show. So I'm going to be kind of going over um, eggs. Ooh. And kind of love eggs. eggs and prepping eggs. You know, those kind of fancy brunch. Get your mama's big hat on. Go out mm -hmm. on the porch. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. kind of feel for Mother's Day. Um, but I asked you guys to think of a movie for me to inspire me for um, kind of cooking in the last uh, segment. And we'll get to that in a minute. I also gave you the opportunity to pick a movie of your own if you wanted to. Did either of you pick a movie of your own? So we each... Mm -hmm picked a movie of our own okay to make it a fun challenge and to also get with the times mm -hmm. perfect okay so i want to hear your movie choices let's give us a little sample of what this looks like let's hear your movie choices and i want to hear why you chose that movie 
Chris, you go first. Okay, fabulous. So when the thing came up, this movie instantly popped into my mind. Uh, it's from the mid nineties. I absolutely love it. It's iconic. Uh, it's my favorite John Waters film in existence. And that is Serial Mom, which I think is one of <laughs> Kathleen Turner's best work that she's ever done. Also has Sam Watterson, Ricky Lake, um, and a whole host of other people. And what I love about Serial Mom is the juxtaposition of what we assume a bread and butter suburban goody two shoe, uh, you know, mom and wife and suburbanite is to be. And then she actually turns out to be this vulgar serial killer who is taking out her neighbors left and right for the most nonsensical things. <laughs> uh, and to me, that just speaks to my soul in such a profound way, because haven't we all had those moments where somebody wears white after Labor Day or is hypocritical or does something uh, ridiculous to one of our family members or chews loudly? And we're like, you know what? This person deserves to die. And then Kathleen Turner comes in and she does that while Annie's... <laughs> uh, Tomorrow plays in the background. <laughs> oh my God. So waves of nostalgia just washed over me when you mentioned that film. There's these moments in my life where I'm like, how did I not know then? And my, <laughs> my love of that film was probably one of those moments. Because like, first off, what parents let their like six-year-old child watch that film? <laughs> but I did. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like two, you're like, I loved it. Like I was feeling this. I'm like, she deserves to die. <laughs> <laughs> oh so fantastic um joe what was your selection i had originally picked one option because i was super obsessed with it but the more i was thinking about it the more i was like hold on there has been one standard of woman that i've always wanted to work up to as a mom and that is marcella in selena <gasps> now um, growing up in a Latinx family, there's always like those weird expositions. There's the male and feminine roles that people play and the masculine role tends to be a little bit like domineering and in control of everything, which I respect that. But also I kind of want that mom who's like, I'm going to take care of you. I supporting you. Don't stop dreaming ever. Whatever you want can happen. Teaches me how to dance, holds my head as I cry in her lap. And Constance Marie and Selena was that woman. And ever since then, I was like, you know what? What a great mom who was like, okay, we are all in this together. We are working as a family. I'm going to help create that bustier. I'm going to rhinestone it. I'm going to help take care of it. And if that's what you want, I'm going to help get you there because who am I to stand in your way? I will help you get there. And what better thing of a parent to do? First off, Joe, it's not a bustier. It's a boosty caca. And... <laughs> It's a bra. So the last thing I kind of want to get with you guys a little bit is let's get a real tea here. Let's talk Ooh. about yo mamas, right? We're going to get real here. Ooh. So I would love to talk to you guys. It's Mother's Day. This is a cooking show. I would like you guys to talk about your kind of experience or memories with your mother and food. Both of good, bad, and ugly. Ooh. I will start so you feel comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was ready, but I'll take it. <laughs> I, love, I love my mom. Mm -hmm. she cannot cook <laughs> <laughs> which is i'm thankful for because i think that's why i can cook <laughs> because at a young age i was like hmm, i think i might try dinner can i stay at grandma's because she lets me cook <laughs> and then i know it's going to be okay but my mom some of my memories first off dry spaghetti don't ask me how spaghetti's dry she found a way Everything was cooked, but dry. When you need a glass of water after taking a bite of spaghetti, we have a problem. <laughs> and I, your mom. <laughs> Two, my mom would make fried pork chops with garlic. Sounds fantastic. Everyone loves a fried pork chop, except for they mm -hmm. weren't fried. They were pan boiled. That's right. She would put like two inches of water and then like thinly slice garlic into these little paper sheets and then equally distribute them all over the pork chop and then set that in this boiling hot water. So pork, in, it would just seize up and turn gray and then the garlic would like meld into the pork because it was boiled in there. And whenever you are that mean to garlic, it becomes like extra bitter. And so, oh... It was like... I don't like that. Yeah, I hated it. So 
that's my experience with my mom and cooking. Um, so me and my mom are super, super close. I consider her one of my best friends. And I feel like it's always been that way, mostly because I saw her as the Marcella to my Selena. And my mom is an incredible cook. Um, both of my parents are incredible cooks. I don't know. I don't know what happened to me. I am not an incredible cook. But um, in my family, we are all chunky Latinas because we all love eating. And I used to have a weird relationship with food. I uh, suffered from like a couple of eating disorders based off of things that came out of my life. Um, and as an adult or as I matured, me and my mom got to be so close due to food where my mom would come home like super, super late from work or something. And she's like, well, I'm starving and I need to eat. So she would make something and I was always up because I don't sleep. And then it would just be us privately having this delicious meal. It was never just like a tiny little thing. It was always like a seven course meal. She's like, I don't care if it's 2 a.m. We're going to eat. And uh, I just remember sitting at the table with my mom for hours, just talking about everything to the point where one night I feel like she got home from work. We ate, talked all through the night. She's like, I have to go to work again. So it's always been a good thing. And uh, coming from a Latinx family, like we will sit down for hours during a meal and that's why you have to make so much food because you will eat be stuffed continue the conversation and then be like i'm hungry again and then you just start picking again at whatever's on the table and thankfully my mom is a good cook and she's good at conversation and she's an incredible storyteller so i've always loved sharing a meal with my mom i know that there is never time wasted when it's me and my mom eating <laughs> i love that oh that's so beautiful um so um <laughs> I'm going to share, uh, if my mother ever watches this, I will totally deny everything that I'm about <laughs> to say and just tell her that you hired a body double, uh, ginger doppelganger to step in for me and spout this fake news lies. Kathleen Turner deserved that Oscar for playing yeah. you. Oh my God. Thank you. That is what I'm saying. Um, I love my mama so much. I love everything about her. Um, and our relationship with food was always interesting because my mom was a vegetarian. She was a vegetarian uh, during a time when that was very um, out of the norm. And we were a good old Midwestern family. So it was meat and potatoes. And if you remove one of those from the equation, people get real confused and they get <laughs> real nervous. Um, so my mom would always tell me that it, it was an interesting thing being someone who cooked for a family of meat eaters, not being a meat eater herself. And that was always a, um, weird relationship and, and it caused tension. And both of my parents worked and they, they worked a lot. Um, and so eventually at some point, my sister and I learned how to cook meals for ourselves. One, because you know, at some point we're like, uh, we're hungry and we need to eat something, but also too, to help our parents out because, you know, my mom and dad would get up at like 4.30 in the morning and would be working until 7.30 at night. Um, and at some point you begin to see that struggle. And so food in a lot of ways became this, um, not source of resentment or tension, but it became this place where, my sister and I thought we could help out in, in what it is that we did. And from a very early age, you know, we all had chores, we all had things that we did. And as we got older, we continued to take on more and more responsibilities um, to help both of our parents out. And so cooking was one of them. My mama was not a sweet person. Um, and she was also very healthy, you know, on top of being a, a massage therapist and a personal trainer and aerobics instructor. So, you know, churl, I feel you. Um, <laughs> like, you know, I, I was the fat kid growing up. And sometimes people would be like, how did that happen? <laughs> um, because all the things I loved, my mama did not eat and also did not love. Like, not only did my mama not make sweets, she didn't like them, which I sort of inherited. Um, but she also didn't really like salty things as well. I mean, I could down a plate of chips or debone a turkey from across the room but my mama had like constraint did you get a little excited joe when i yes, said I that did. <laughs> I know you did. um so i learned to cook from a very early age um and i actually almost went to culinary school because i got in, into baking and so my entire high school um career as a way to deal with my blossoming sexuality uh, was to bake and so i <laughs> 
read a lot of cookbooks and I baked a lot of uh, amazing food and would bring it into my class and student orgs and uh, thought I wanted to be a chef and actually apply to a culinary school in Pennsylvania, actually got into it. Um, and eventually uh, one of my family members sat me down. They're like, no, <laughs> no, you don't want to do that. You think you want to do that, but that's not what you want to do. Um, and I was like, okay. <laughs> um, and I just remember this, you know, my mom was, you know, a, you know, she was all right. She was a fine cook, you know. Um, and I remember this one time, you know, because my mother's German and she wanted to introduce us to German cooking, which is, I mean, it's fine. I mean, German <laughs> cooking, it's fine. I wouldn't say it's spectacular. Um, and so she was making some of these traditional German foods for us. Um, and I remember just not getting it and just being a snot nosed kid that didn't appreciate it and didn't think it was really good. Um, and my poor mama, cause Lord knows she tried and she wanted so much for us to embrace our culture and heritage. Um, but like, I didn't get what Schweitzel was. Like I didn't, I still don't really quite understand what it is. Um, but I just, that's one of my memories I was thinking of about cooking with my mom and food. Um, and it's really funny because on my dad's side, we're Italian. And so, you know, Joe, much like your family's like food and wine was just central to any conversation and, uh, gathering. We could be fighting and screaming at each other. No one would put their wine glass down and no one would stop eating. Like fighting would not deter our family from enjoying the meal that my grandmother had worked so hard on. And if you thought about removing yourself from the table, she would let you have it. <laughs> well, that's all I had for, for you, Charles. I'm so excited to have you here. And um, you'll actually, everyone can see this. It will have come out the night before, but I'm going to be on your show. Woo! Yes. Yes! Oh my gosh, so excited so to have fun. you. It's going to be so much fun. Thank you so much for having us. I've had such a blast on here. I'm going to show this to my mom and my mom's going to cry because my mom is a crier oh. anytime you show affection, which I don't very often. So she's going to absolutely love this. So thanks for doing this and oh, thank yeah. you to all the moms out there. Yeah, thank you moms. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you mom. I'm not going to show this to my mama. <laughs> <laughs> but I love my mama and I love all the mamas in this world. Yeah, I love my mama. I She might not get this episode either. <laughs> either <laughs> like it's still so real tea uh, no, it's some shady queens <laughs> all right so we are to my favorite segment you did what honey you did what honey and i've decided to kind of change this segment up instead of making it about like a found pantry item or whatever i'm going to use i'm just going to make it a challenge so the challenge is to use an ingredient or to use something and this week we're celebrating those lovely queens of our lives, that's right, mothers. And so I knew that I wanted to do eggs and I wanted to do brunch. And so I needed the challenge. And this week I'm also collaborating with two of my favorite human beings, the co-host of the Deadweight Survival Guide available on Ghostlight TV, Mr. Christopher Daniels and Joe Daniel Montalongo. And I asked them to pick a movie inspired by Mother's Day um, for me to use as inspiration to create a did you guys decide on a unified movie to for me to cook with? Yeah, okay. I think we did. Okay. Ooh, I will yes. let Chris announce it. <laughs> Ooh, I love this. Ooh, some tension. So, you know, because in many respects, uh, JD and I are completely unique, individualistic souls that are in so many ways um, disparate and on opposite sides of everything from one another. But there are many things in life that we are soul united in. And one of the things that brought us together so tightly and so profoundly in our relationship was our deep and unwavering love for Mamma Mia. And not just Mamma Mia, Mamma Mia one and Mamma and Mia two. two. Here, Here we, we go, go again. again. The sequel. And I was like, what did you say? And then I was like, 
what did you, well, actually, I gushed because I love those movies, but I was a little panicked because I don't cook Greek uh, cuisine. So um, what is the quintessential brunch item? I think I'm going to go with a Benedict. And I got inspired by the line dot, dot, dot from the journal entry scene at the very beginning. I wanted to represent these three dads in a Benedict topped with a very feminine egg, a nice poached, soft, supple, delicious, silky, you know you want seconds egg. And then creamy tzatziki, you know, that Greek chorus in the background, that celebration of Greeks, and top it with some nice, cool tzatziki instead of holidays. So I'm going to play with the Benedict. I have some ideas. I'm going to represent kind of each of their cultures. One of them's an architect who lives in the United States, but he's actually Irish. So I'm going to do like a boxy base, I think, with potatoes. Uh, one of them is, you know, he's a British banker. So I'm going to do like roast pork. I made a pork roast and need to use the leftovers. So perfect. And then the adventure I went on last night is I made watermelon chutney because uh, Bill Anderson is like the worldly traveler dad. And I remember Harry and him are on the boat. And he's like, oh, yeah, you write those books. Uh, bloke on a boat in Botswana. And then I was like, oh, Botswana. Yes, I had to rewatch the movie for inspo. But Botswana is where they believe watermelons were invented. So I was like, ooh, what if I did like a watermelon chutney or like a watermelon salsa? Pot, I'm going to put one and a quarter cup of vinegar, one cup of sugar, two tablespoons of salt, and about a teaspoon of black peppercorns. I'm gonna stir that around, get that nice and mixed and blended. Then I'm gonna throw in one inch of ginger, four cloves of garlic, let that come to a boil. Once that comes to a boil, I'm gonna add in my watermelon rind. Now this is just watermelon rind, that's right. It's the white part of the watermelon, not the actual outside skin. It was a little bit difficult to peel that outside skin, but I got it taken care of. This is just that sort of inner flesh that we don't typically eat, we throw away. I'm gonna let that boil uh, for five minutes to soften up that rind. Remember, one reason why we don't eat it is it's kind of tough and hard. Once that's done boiling, I'm gonna throw in my chilies, my mint, and my preserved lemon peel, and then throw a bowl on top of it to keep it submerged, and then let it sit overnight in the fridge until I'm ready to use it. Found out for the sequel, Cher is a vegetarian, so we're gonna do a watermelon steak topped with feta and honey. So let's get started cooking. I'm gonna start by boiling my potatoes. Oh yeah, and I have fresh sourdough bread to make. So I gotta bake bread, I gotta boil potatoes, so much to do, let's get started. So I kinda want equal parts of both potatoes. Can I get cookie? I have so much to do, so I'm like ignoring the camera and I'm just trying to go. Um, I want equal parts papas. I'm gonna go ahead and I think I'm going to boil these and grate these fresh to get mixed in there. I'm also gonna use some spring, oh, I'm making the box tea, which is like a potato pancake. Um, and that represents, um, oh God, what's his name? The Pierce Brosnan um, character. He lives in the U.S. as an architect, but he is Irish. Um, so I'm going to make an Irish box tea with some spring onion. These are going to be grated later. Let's move on to the tzatziki. And then, no, I'm going to do the tzatziki first. It, it needs to marinate. Never mind. I wanted to use the cute bowl. It's a little Mediterranean. Cotari. Oh, I love cucumber. Nothing says like fresh spring to me like a cool cucumber. Um, that's in the summer. I love a good gin and tonic always. And a little cucumber and mint in your gin and tonic. Ugh. It's all gone. It's all gone. Okay. We're gonna need that other half of cucumber. There we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and add in a tablespoon of. Uh, lemon juice. Uh, it'll elevate the creaminess. 
the lemon juice is going to elevate that creaminess. Uh, going to make it seem really light and springy. Then I have fresh mint from the garden. I don't have any dill in the garden. Um, and the store was out. So I had to get one of those squeeze tube herbs. I'm going to try it. I did taste it beforehand. It's salty. So I'm not going to add any salt to this because it just, nah, maybe a smidge of salt. Um, it just scares me. Let's add my herbs in. Mm. Now, just like last week, we're going to add in our oil, but we're going to do so slowly. And that was like two tablespoons of oil, I think. So there is a lot of tartness, and I'm concerned because that relish is going to be tart. So I'm going to add in some salt. I don't have a lame, so I'm doing the best I can. So now I got to find a way to transport this into my hot pot. I'm going to go ahead and get... try out some technology. I've never used a grater on a food processor before, so let's see how it works because this is not working for me. Oh, whoa, potato. I love raw potato secrets. So I'm gonna take one of my already messy towels and I'm gonna just Dump this in there, and we're going to squeeze out all of that liquid. Right, your ricer. Makes them a lot easy. Put these potatoes in here. Take like a big giant garlic press, essentially for potatoes. Oh, that being said, you know what? Tzatziki needs garlic. That's what it needs. We'll see. I have uh, 250 grams of flour, two, um, one and a half teaspoons of baking soda, I have, uh, I'm gonna add 250 grams of fresh shredded potato, but I'm gonna add my mashed first. So 250 grams of mashed. I was hoping there'd be extra, bite it. And then if there's extra of these, these can be frozen into shoestring hash browns. Let's add 250 of this. 300 milliliters of um, buttermilk. There we go. So, kind of really uh, pudgy mixture. Here's my deliciously hot crusty bread. Look at her. Mm -hmm. oh, these, sm <laughs> this batter smells heavenly. So I'm gonna do one at a time. I think they do need another little finish of salt, so I'm just gonna salt one side. Yeah, getting them smooth, 
low cap, that's the key. And there we have it, our box D. Alright, so I made a pork roast last night, and I'm going to use the pork kind of to represent the British sort of element. Um, in here, but you could have used prosciutto, you could use any sort of meat based sausage, anything you want for the meat base. So, the box is my bread that now I'm going to kind of get my meat together. I need to just reheat it. I'm going to start with this is just a little water and um, probably a quarter cup of uh, wine and a quarter cup of water, and then I'm just going to add those pork slices in there just to kind of reheat them, get them going. All right, so I found out Cher was a vegetarian and I wanted to represent that because she is in the second movie. So I'm gonna get my pan hot with a little uh, grapeseed oil. My dog's going crazy outside. We are going to make bum ba ba watermelon steaks. So I cut my watermelon one inch thick pieces like this. I put it in the fridge to let it dry out uh, open for like an hour when I started. And now I'm gonna pat them down dry again so I don't get like overly splattered. You wanna start these slow. It's watermelon after all, it's wet. It's going to burn you if this splatters. So you're gonna to wanna to start this on a low temp. So we're making watermelon steaks. We're gonna start this on a very low temp. We're going to take it to like medium low. Get this oil hot, get this pan hot, get these steaks in here. Then they're gonna cook five minutes on each side. And then we're going to turn the temp up to sear and seal. So I got my feta on a tray. I'm gonna roast that for 400 on 400 for eight minutes. Feta has a very high um, melting um, temp, so you know you can really kind of cook it and grill it, and it does great things for the cheese. Go ahead and pop this in the oven for eight minutes. And there we have it. So to reheat my eggs, I just added, I, you know, you can put your um, poached eggs in cold water, store them in the fridge, you can make them the night before. To heat them up, just use really hot water and let them sit for kind of two minutes. Um, and that's kind of what I'm doing here. I just filled the bowl with hot water with the eggs in there and I'm gonna let it sit. plate is simple. I'm going to have my boxies down. I'm going to add my warm kind of pork here. Spoon just a hint of this chutney. One of our poached eggs. Oh no, it's ripping. It's ripping. Then we go in with our tzatziki on top. So that's a uh, a Sam Carmichael base. That's a Harry Bright uh, meat. That's a Bill Anderson chutney. The egg is Sophie. And then we top it off with a little bit of uh, Meryl Streep, some tzatziki. 
So this is going to be served with a grilled um, watermelon, just like that. You just thinly slice that feta, just like this, and it's gonna become like this different beast. When you roast feta, it's just divine. And then honey. Ugh. And as you can see, the our yolk broke, um, so it is what it is. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a taste. This poor yolk broke, so I'm gonna eat this one. Mm. The watermelon's interesting. Mmm. I like it. Warm. The texture changes. It's not as grainy. With that feta and honey is a nice warm treat. Let's try this sort of boxy mess. Definitely lighter than your normal Benedict. Egg is heavenly. The pork is nice. Mm. Oh, I think it's a successful dish. Um, so we have kind of like a Mamma Mia inspired Benedict. There's tzatziki on top, a um, what on top? A tzatziki, it's like a, a yogurt, cucumber, Greek dressing. Okay. Um, poached egg. There is watermelon rind chutney, which is going to be a little pickly, and I know you don't like pickles. And okay. then there's some roasted pork, and then it's on a boxty, which is like a potato and onion. Um, patty pancake okay um and then this is a piece of grilled watermelon or a pan fried watermelon um cooked down a watermelon steak with some roasted um feta and honey delicious what do i eat first whatever you want this is going to be a little sweeter this is going to be savory um, and there's your yolk she's sliding out she's sliding out okay, yeah. do you see how beautiful that egg yolk is perfectly cooked yes, thank I you love it A little boxy, is it like a like a pancake? Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts? Oh. Oh my god. It's really good. Like really, really good. Oh my god. Interesting. I thought he wasn't gonna like it. He hates like pickle y stuff, so I thought he Yeah, but there's like a lot of it's like a there's a lot of layers. The the profile is quite large. So what is it? The Benedict, right? Yeah. So the Benedict is is uh Wow, slay. Uh, I just love how it is sweet, and but it's also savory, but it's also... And so what's this on top? Feta? Feta and honey. Feta, honey. And then just pan roasted or pan fried watermelon. Get a glaze on there. Is there anything on the watermelon? Just the honey and feta. Oh, wow. There's almost a squash taste that happens to the watermelon. Almost, yeah. The texture is interesting. It becomes like soft and not grainy for me. Right, right. I was expecting it to kind of fall apart. Mm -hmm. And yeah. fall apart. Yeah, it holds its own pretty nicely. Mm. The fed is a nice addition. Oh my god. Done well. Very eccentric. Just it like is a movie. Very <laughs> eccentric. Uh, yeah, I'm left speechless, so uh, I'm just going to go. Okay, you're going to. Um, Take that with you. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. <laughs> Couldn't wrap up this Mother's Day video without a couple thanks. Um, I really want to give thanks from the bottom of my heart. All the moms out there, your jobs are hard and you do such a fantastic job at doing the best you can to take care of a family and children. I also want to thank you to all those women who are trying, who have lost kids and who haven't gotten there yet. You're special too. And just keep trying um, and keep spreading love. 
Women are an important and essential part of our society and culture, and we need to nurture them and take care of them um, just as much as they take care of us. I hope you all are having a fantastic Mother's Day. I love you all.